Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen, the chair of the board. Um, hopefully this afternoon's meeting will go much further than last week. Uh, we had uh, a little bit of excitement as there was a nationwide Microsoft problem with Teams, and so the meeting was um, cut out halfway through. So after we do the executive director report in the minutes, I just want to um, give anybody that has an opportunity and wishes to comment on um, what we had been discussing at that point in the meeting, which was the quality results. And Michelle Degree, are you on the line? Not hearing Michelle. I guess the board members will have to try to do their best to uh, help out with any public comments on that. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the executive director's report, Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think um, Elena should be on this call and maybe somebody could reach out to Michelle to see if she yeah. could talk. I'm here and I'm, I'm paying Michelle, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Um, so thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of announcements on public comment and then some scheduling reminders. First, we have two uh, open public comment uh, items right now. The first one we just started today and it's regarding the topic of our meeting today, which is the revised 2020 Medicare benchmark proposal. Um, the Public comment starts today, as I said, and it ends at noon on October 20th. We do have a potential vote planned for uh, October 21st on this issue, which you will hear more about momentarily. And then the second open public uh, comment period is on the uh, draft regulatory alignment papers, and those are open. That comment period is open until the end of the month, October 30th. And if you have any questions, you can consult our uh, public comment website or, or, or section on our website or reach directly out to Abigail. And the second item is just to update you on some scheduling as um, Chair Mullen talked about in our last meeting, we had the technical difficulties. We were supposed to have a hospital budget debrief discussion um, following the quality results discussion. Uh, due to scheduling, we are going to put that back on the calendar next uh, Wednesday, the 21st, and we'll be hearing from the same folks who were lined up to discuss that last week. And um, that is all I have to report. If there aren't any questions, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. The next item are the minutes of last Wednesday. Is there a motion? Still moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded, seconded to, approve, to approve the minutes without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any further conversation? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. So with that, I am going to give anybody an opportunity. Um, I believe that Dale was um, the one that was making the last public comment. So I don't know if Dale finished that public comment or what, but I do understand that uh, Michelle is also on the line with Elena. And um, although we don't have the entire panel, um, we certainly welcome public comment on that discussion. Would anybody wish to make any public comment? Hearing none, we'll get in right into today's business. And the next item on the agenda is, I'll be turning it over to Sarah Lindberg for a discussion on the Medicare benchmarks. Sarah? Okay, so is everyone able to see my screen? Not yet. Now we can. Okay. Okay, wonderful. So thank you for um, taking time for me to speak with you today. Today I am coming to you because we need to talk about the current year, the 2020 Medicare benchmark, um, which we proposed and voted on at the end of last year, uh, but due to the public health emergency uh, requires some revision. So uh, our objective today is to look at those, to review what we mean when we talk about a Medicare benchmark, because the 
benchmark as it exists today can no longer really be considered appropriate due to the effects of the public health emergency. And given that there is ongoing uncertainty about how the rest of the year is going to play out, it is our opinion that the appropriate uh, methodology would be using a retrospective trend factor for the current performance year. Um, if we were not to submit this revision to CMS, they do have the authority in their participation agreement with OneCare to just revise it on their own and not involve us. So I think that this change will happen uh, whether we do this revision or not. And in the spirit of the agreement, I would behoove us to uh, make this revision accordingly. So moving on to slide three, just as a reminder, there are lots of different financial targets that we talk about with the all-payer model. Um, often when I'm talking with you, I am talking about the all-payer model financial targets. And that is a contract between the state of Vermont and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS. And that's where we get our all-payer growth limit of 3.5 to 4.3% from 2017 to 2022. Um, there's also a Medicare-specific financial target in that agreement, but that is not what I'm here to talk to you today about. Today, I'm here to talk to you about um, an agreement between CMS and OneCare Vermont called the Medicare Participation Agreement, and that sets annual prospective targets or benchmarks for the spending of Medicare beneficiaries attributed to OneCare Vermont. So these are the live to one care is responsible for in the current performance year. Now the um, contract, the all-payer model contract does give us authority to propose these targets for approval to CMS. And that's the process that we tend to do um, in December preceding a um, performance year. Uh, I should say November into December uh, preceding an upcoming performance year because we try to set the targets in a prospective manner However, turning to slide four, um, COVID has really put a wrench in the works of anything prospective. And so Medicare has acknowledged a lot of these problems and has offered some flexibilities um, to um, a lot of different programs. Uh, one of them is that any expenditures associated with a COVID-19 episode is excluded from the ACO's accountability. So it is removed from their total cost of care. To date, that's about $1.3 million for um, beneficiaries attributed to OneCare, and statewide, it's $2.5 million, and we expect to remove those costs from our um, statewide total cost of care, which we'll talk about another day. Um, another flexibility, uh, flexibility that they've offered is that any shared losses um, associated with um, the time period of our public health emergency are mitigated. Um, there's a little bit of a complex formula but the upshot is that there essentially won't be any downside risk to the ACO in 2020. Uh, that it's going to be a because we know now that the the public health emergency is at least extended into next year. Um, we feel really confident that um, any downside loss is is really not a concern for 2020. And finally, um, the flexibility is they're saying that um, while we uh, we usually insist on a prospective trend factor, um, given the uncertainty, we would recommend using a retrospective regional trend for these financial targets or benchmarks. Um, and turning to slide five, um, I just want to remind you about kind of the core components of how a financial target is set in the Medicare program. It's got three principal components. There's an estimate for um, historical experience. Um, there are the number of prospectively aligned beneficiaries, and then there's a trend rate. So in for 2020, you had elected to use a trend rate of 3.5%, um, but that is the factor that we're really talking about revising in this proposal. And instead of using that guess of growth that we would have expected this year, we're suggesting that we use the actual growth from um, calendar year 19 to calendar year 20 to account for all the uncertainty. And um, if you look at slide six, you can see that um, you know, expenditures really took a dip in response to the public health emergency. 
Um, in Vermont, we've been relatively fortunate compared to some other states in that most of these declines in expenditures um, have to do with uh, people n not seeking care um, instead of uh, seeing bumps in costs due to um, the system being overwhelmed or excessive COVID costs. Um, but as you can see, in April of 2020, costs were about half of what we might have expected um, in a typical year. Um, I'm sure this is all near and dear to your heart, having just gone through the hospital budget review process, but um, these are just how it's affected Medicare as a payer. And if we look at that on slide seven on a per person spending, so if we look at um, statewide, so all of Vermont, people who we think would be eligible to attribute to this ACO program, and we compare their, um, per, their monthly expenditures um, in January through May, you'll see again that costs were about half of what we would have expected in April. They're starting to rebound in May, and um, in June, they're, they're, they're starting to converge again. So we, we think if the recovery continues to be as successful as we are seeing now, that um, probably the rest of 2020 will look similar to 2019. Um, however, that's a big if. It's hard to say um, what might happen, and that is um, causes a lot of um, confusion and uncertainty for um, both the ACO and uh, Medicare. So basically, the slide eight lines out the, um, the the meat of the proposal. There is a, a, a draft letter that we plan we would like to send to CMMI for the board to review prior to voting, but essentially we would like to wait until we have three months of paid claims run out for calendar year 2020. So that we would have expect that to have that available around April of 2021. And we would see how um, the comparison population in 19 compared to the actual aligned beneficiaries in 2020 and use that actual trend rate to recalculate the benchmark. Um, and then once we have that number, it will be the board's job to make sure that that target still fulfills our duties as outlined in that all-payer model agreement. And we want to place specific emphasis on Section um, 8B21A, which says that the Vermont Medicare ACO initiative benchmarks should incentivize high-quality care, promote efficient care, and support improvement in the health of aligned beneficiaries. And essentially what we're saying here is that we don't want to set a benchmark that would put any risk on providers to continue to provide that high quality care. So we want to make sure that we know the benchmark today is, is too high, but we don't want to risk it being too low um, with this methodology. So in partnership with CMMI, we would do that calculation and assessment to see that we still think that the benchmark is appropriate. And finally, um, I want to be clear um, that we would still add on the advanced shared savings as it was originally included in the benchmark. And so that was $8.4 million that has already been distributed to the ACO. And as ordered by the Green Mountain Care Board, the ACO has already invested those funds to support the Blueprint for Health in SASH. And so we believe that these programs um, definitively have, have been evaluated to show that they um, help further the goals of the all-payer model, both in, both in terms of quality access and um, cost savings. And so uh, I believe that, you know, in particular, the, the network participants have some concerns um, about the, the risk of having to pay that money back. And uh, we at the Green Mountain Care Board and our federal partners, um, you know, we are we're very mindful of that and uh, sensitive to that fear. Um, and we, you know, will assess the results of the benchmark. But this money is is added on. It's not part of the performance risk. So this won't be a change per se, but we just want to make sure that the federal government is aware this money has already been spent and that the one care didn't really have any discretion in that spending. So that's going to be part of um, the, you know, the review when the benchmark comes back. And I would say that this um, amount assumed growth It assumed a growing trend that um, maybe won't be, uh, won't be 
possible <laughs> given the COVID emergency. So we just want to, you know, be sensitive to that um, assumption uh, with whatever the benchmark comes back at. So that's a high level um, overview of the letter to the federal government. I'm happy to talk about any questions or concerns you have about the letter uh, at this time. Questions for Sarah? Hi, Sarah. Did we lose her? Hello. Hello? I'm here. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> I can hear you. Um, can you go back to slide six, please? Uh, yes, I can. I think I can, as the little engine says. Yes, there is slide six. Not yet for me, but you're getting there slowly. <laughs> there you go. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, obviously the pandemic is an extraordinarily and unusual event. So, you know, this effort uh, certainly makes sense to me. I'm just wondering what the, you know, any guardrails might be around um, a recalculation of, of the benchmark, because you can look at of September and October, where there was no pandemic, and there's a four, 14 point differential there. Um, and so I'm just wondering kind of from a statistical point of view, what might might be a range around the benchmark um, as opposed to uh, a precise calculation? Uh, that's a great question. And uh, we, we floated the, um, I'm gonna turn my camera off because it's looking wonky. Uh, we had asked our federal partners about uh, the possibility of such um, guardrails. And I think that the, 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 the fear on their side is that it's just so much uncertainty that they didn't feel comfortable documenting any specific number in writing. Uh, but I would say that it looks like um, even if uh, we were to have in increased utilization, um, there's, I, I, I don't see a chance that we would get up to the former benchmark. Uh, so I think if I were a betting man, I'd say we're probably looking at about a negative 5% trend rate um, when the year is over, but um, there's still a lot unseen. Mm -hmm. um, just a couple of more. Um, are there, um, I mean, we faced this issue uh, in the hospital budget process, and generally, hospitals kind of trended up, you know, off of information through February. Um, and I'm just wondering, are there any complications uh, if if a different methodology um, is applied to this benchmark? Um, so I think that's a great question. Uh, and that's, we're actually grappling with that for thinking through the 2021 benchmark. So is there a way we can have something that's truly prospective given this uncertainty with a little bit more experience and perhaps an opportunity to revisit um, that estimate a little bit into 2021? Uh, but I do think that uh, for 2020, uh, any, any other, um, substantial change to the methodology uh, might be something that uh, would have some time and resource constraints associated with it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I, I'm just I mean, I'm just worried about, you know, the, the two different processes being on a diff different platforms um, and and whether and maybe it doesn't make any difference at all. But I'm but alignment always yeah, seems to yeah. be. Um, favored over non-alignment. So that's that's why I asked the question. Sure. The tricky thing is that, um, you know, the hospital budget is based on, you know, care that the hospital delivers. So whoever shows up, whereas, you know, this is a measure of where, of the people, wherever they get the care. And mm -hmm. so there's some even more variability there. So for instance, I'm, I'm keenly interested in if we have a marked difference in our snowbird uh, behavior. Uh, due to this event. So that would mean that, you know, there'd be kind of um, probably less spending just because compared to the prices we're seeing for care sought down in Florida, um, it tends to be lower um, costs 
uh, when people have their care in Vermont. So, you know, I think there's just even more uh, variables at work with this um, kind of um, people behavior aspect that um, is, is certainly a factor in the hospital budget, but might be a little um, uh, easier to, to project. Uh, I shouldn't say it's easy. None of this is easy. <laughs> It's just a different. It's a different. Um, it's a different. Yeah. It's a different. No, it's problem. one of. Yeah. One of one of trying to do the best you can situations. Uh, final question <laughs> is: Are there other states going through this with um, CMI? Uh, obviously, you know there are different um, healthcare reform activities in other states. Is is this um, you know a shared? Uh, I mean, it's not just Vermont. Do, do you know of other states that are going through the same same process? Sure. I think the most um, close example would be the Next Generation ACO program, and they are using this retrospective trend. So that's another kind of point in its favor is that um, that's what the Next Gen ACO program is doing. Um, they are planning to do that again in 2021, but um, we and our federal partners are in agreement that we would really like to try to figure out something truly prospective for 2021 to help with um, predictability and stability for our healthcare providers. Thank you. Anytime. Other questions from the board or comments? Maybe just a quick question, Sarah. Um, this is Jessica. Can you just remind me uh, who the reference population will be in 2019? Um, that you're going to use to calculate that, um, you know, the trend rate. Obviously, the 2020 will be the attributed lives in 2020. Can you just remind me who they will be in 2019, the reference population? Sure. Yep. So that would be the um, folks who would have attributed to the ACO in 2019 using the 2020 network. So we have a fake performance year that we use and that way we're able to capture the expensive end-of-life care that we know will hit a cohort of medicare beneficiaries okay thank you so it's not the actual attributed in 2019 it's the would have been attributed in 2019 if the 2020 network were the same in 20 and 19. correct yeah there is some there's quite a bit of overlap i'd say about you know I, I don't want to speak off without reviewing it, but uh, there's quite a few people who are in both those populations, but it's the people who die that are um, really important to incorporate in that um, estimate. Sure. Okay. Thank you so much. No problem. Other questions or comments from the board? This is Robin. I'll just say this makes um, sense to me. I think we all, when the pandemic hit, recognized that it was going to create a lot of uncertainty and difficulty in terms of setting benchmarks moving forward as well as budgets. So um, thank you for a very clear presentation. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Sarah, when would you need action by the board on this? Uh, it would be ideal to have a vote uh, next week so that uh, we can get approval from our federal partners in advance of the next One Care Vermont board meeting in November so that they can vote and um, sign a contract that reflects this, um, all these flexibilities, not just the re retrospective trend, but also um, removing the COVID costs and uh, the mitigation of the downside risk. So we really need to uh, get this uh posted for public comment as soon as possible. Yeah, I believe the public comment period is currently open for this, so uh, we welcome public feedback. The only other thing I, I wanted to chime in with, um, and I apologize, I forgot to say this earlier, is um, I, I appreciate also um, taking a look at those blueprint community, uh, PMPM community health team and SASH payments that are in what people call the advanced shared savings. Um, given that that was a specific request by the state from the federal government that we that we'd be able to maintain Medicare participation in those programs and that that Medicare participation be able to um, work the same way that it had been working as well as um, 
be trended, which it hadn't been prior to that. So I think given the situation, um, I'm, I really like the idea of being able to maintain that amount, even, even if we're uh, adjusting the benchmark, because I do think that the community health teams have been working remotely. And so, um, you know, that work, I, I think was maybe less impacted from some of the pandemic since it's the type of work that could be done easily, more easily through telemedicine, et cetera. Absolutely. And I would just say that um, our federal partners um, have not had any uh, criticisms about that program or, or desire to um, cut the funding. I think it's just that um, because it is part of the savings calculation, it feels a little bit riskier to the network um, than maybe it did last December. Sure. I mean, it, there's been a lot of confusion about that, I think, from the beginning in yeah, terms absolutely. of how that works. <laughs> Um, and uh, the other thing I was going to suggest, you may have, we may have already done this, but since we do have the federal evaluation showing savings for Blueprint and SAC, I wonder if maybe we should just post links to those on our website. I know you referred to it in your PowerPoint, but um, those are publicly available if people were Great interested in, in looking at those. We can put those up, Robin. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the board? Hearing none, I'm going to open it up for public comment. Is there public comment? Mike Del Treco. Uh, this is Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, so, so just to clarify, this presentation that Sarah just went through is to revise the methodology on how you will recalculate the benchmark. It doesn't really talk about any new benchmark today. Is that correct? Correct. We wouldn't know the new benchmark until about April of next year. Correct. We'd have to have the, at least the three months of run out, Mike, to, to set that. Um, once the methodology is finalized, however, um, we will be able to get um, reports from our federal partners to help um, track uh, where we're doing, well, how it stands to date. Um, we are hoping to get our next um, sense of that uh, towards the end of this month, and those are reports that are also shared with OneCare. Right, so that uh, you, you tipped my next question, which is um, three months of run out but if it's a retrospective look on trend, um, you know, how are you going to marry those two things together to to develop the new benchmark? Because um, you know, the sooner we know this, the better. And and I understand the challenges you're facing. So just just clarifying questions. And that's all. Thanks, Mike. Other public comment? Other public comment? Any other public comment? And again, um, we do have an open public comment period that's posted to the website, and we will be taking um, any public comment. So um, if you think of something uh, later or in the next few days, um, please uh, provide us with that public comment. So thank you, Sarah. I think this was uh, very, very helpful. Um, uncertain times, but um, it's clear that it's better that the state of Vermont um, takes action rather than just letting the feds go ahead and take the action on their own. Yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? 
So I'm going to take this opportunity. I know it's uh, probably not her last meeting because I believe that um, she's still working through the end of this month. But um, many years ago, I had the opportunity as a legislator to um, work with a member of the administration that always came into the, our committee and um, gave us the information and the facts and um, was clearly an incredibly hardworking uh, state employee. She left and uh, what I would call went to the dark side and became a lobbyist after that. And um, and then a few years back, um, she left that role and went over to work for MVP. And it's been a pleasure working for her um, as she really has been the Vermont face of MVP, um, at least during my tenure on the uh, board. And so, um, Susan Gorkowski, um, we're going to miss you. Um, we're jealous that you're you're uh, retiring, um, but we do want to thank you for your many many years of service in the uh, healthcare arena, and uh, wish you all the best in the future. So thank you, Susan. Well, and thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to go away totally. I'll probably still call into your meetings, just out of curiosity. But thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Thank Congratulations, you. Congratulations, Susan. Is there any other new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.